Let me encourage you as the, uh, as the scripture is being put up on the screen here, that this week especially, but I've sort of made it a practice in the last couple of months, I have literally swam. I mean, I put on the snorkeling gear, the fins, right, got my spear and just went diving into this passage this week. And I've made it a habit, right, to use the scripture that we will be worshiping in and within to swim around, to let it be my life source for the week. And I come up occasionally for air and I read some other things, but I make it a habit. I've made it a discipline. I want to encourage you because it comes up a Wednesday when we're together for worship or Bible study. It comes up again in the cakey, in the cakey focus. It will week in and week out starting this week. It's in their bulletin. Jump in. Jump in. If you're interested, I planned about 10 to 15 sermons at a time, at least the, uh, the direction we're going. We know those scriptures for the next couple months. Jump in on Monday. Swim around because I'm sitting over here worshiping, right? Praising that this city isn't even started to, to feel and experience the revival God has for it. And I'm singing it directly out of Acts 2. And I can only do that because I've been swimming in it all week. So I encourage you, jump in on Monday, visit it on Wednesday and Thursday, and see it again on Sunday. Pastor Larry. Then Peter stood up with the eleven, raised his voice, and addressed the crowd. Fellow Jews and all of you who live in Jerusalem, let me explain this to you. Listen carefully to what I say. These people are not drunk, as you suppose. It's only nine in the morning. No, this is what was spoken by the prophet Joel. In the last days, God says, I will pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions. Your old men will dream dreams. Even on my servants, both men and women, I will pour out my spirit in those days, and they will prophesy. Therefore, let all Israel be assured of this. God has made this Jesus, whom you crucified, both Lord and Messiah. When the people heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the other apostles, Brothers, what shall we do? Peter replied, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. The promise is for you and your children and for all who are far off, for all whom the Lord our God will call. With many other words he warned them and he pleaded with them, Save yourselves from this corrupt generation. Those who accepted this message were baptized, and about 3,000 were added to their number that day. For those who have seen me preach before, these are like booby traps up here, right? <laughs> I'm getting a little nervous for myself. Last week, we ended with, the new, with a brand new institution. And when we think institution, of course, we think business or we think nonprofit organization. But it is, happens to be the single institution, the single gathering of people, the single organized collective of individuals in the history of the universe that God says, I put, boom, my stamp of approval on. And this institution, this group of people, this covenanted body, this assembly had their toes on the edge. Some of you remember I almost got hit by the fan with, by my head when my toes were over the edge right here. It's called the church, and they're about to jump off of this cliff called Missions Without Borders, right? Because they were asked to take this crazy good news that said people could actually be resurrected from the dead, that could actually replace Caesar with a new king and lord, and they were going to take this right in the face of the Romans to the ends of the earth. Crazy. And their toes were over the edge. And I said, what's the difference between committing suicide by jumping off of a cliff See if we can. Committing suicide by jumping off of a cliff or being the first, the, the first Christians starting this new church. One thing. The Holy Spirit. That's it. That's everything. Because this Holy Spirit is the thing that gives the power to witness to this resurrection. And without the resurrection, as Paul says, it's all in vain. It's all a waste of our time. If Jesus really did lose, death rules the day, pfft. I'm going, I'm, I'm leaving. We're wasting our time, Paul says. The Holy Spirit, though, is the power. It's the energy. It's the dynamite, which is the root word for, 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 for what we read in Acts. The dynamos, which is the Greek. It's the dynamite power 
that gives us the ability to face risk and challenge and to take this good news of resurrection, of life overcoming death like in Penny Brumbaugh's testimony. Light in the midst of darkness, healing in the, mix of, in the midst of viruses and pain and depression. This is a risk, folks. And this early church had their toes over the edge. I'm on. Okay. And it says in the scripture, we get a piece of it today, and it was in the scriptures last week from the first part of chapter 2. Where, where Peter addresses the fact that the crowds thought they were drunk, right? So today I ask you, what's the difference between the early church with the Holy Spirit and a babbling drunk? Purpose, a mission, boundless mission. Penny said it as best it can be said. These first, these first Christians and the Christians today, you in these chairs, comfortably sitting, are missionaries in disguise. Wow. Wow. What's your job? Do you work for the county? Do you work for the school system? Do you work at Costco? Do you work, where do you work? You thought you worked there. God strategically placed you there and disguised you, right? It's a big masquerade, right? Because really, he's individually handpicking missionaries and putting them at Macy's, right? And putting them at the, at the, Tesoro, uh, the Tesoro gas station and putting them here and putting them there, putting them at the jail, putting psh, 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 psh. And this is where we pick up scripture. This is where we are today, church. Now, I need your help. Because until we quite grasp what the Jews were experiencing at this time, we don't, can't get our heads around the significance, the severity of this wind that blew through the house, the wind that blew through the temple that caught everybody's attention. When was this time? Last week we talked a bit about Pentecost, but let me put it in context, okay? There are three, three holy days that require pilgrimage to Jerusalem. There's the Passover. Can everyone say Passover. There's Pentecost. Everyone say Pentecost. Pentecost. And there's the Feast of Tabernacles. Everybody say the Feast of Tabernacles. Feast of Tabernacles. All three of them celebrated different components of the liberation of the Jews from the Egyptians. Okay? Passover was basically when they got loose. Remember? They, they put blood on their doorways and the sphere blew over them. Right? They were saved. It was like the night before the big exodus. Right? Pentecost. Pentecost celebrated. Pentecost celebrated when they were traveling in the wilderness, the giving of the Torah, the giving of the law, the giving of the books of Moses or the, the law of Moses, right? This, was, this defined the Jews, like we said before, like the Declaration of Independence defines America. And the Feast of Tabernacles or the Feast of Booths, right? Celebrates the faithfulness of God while they wandered for 40 years. So you've got these three feasts, one spring, one summer, one fall. Passo, or excuse me, Pentecost is the one right in the middle. Conditions are the best. Roads are the driest. There's the most time to prepare. Sun's out, cake in the ground so you can travel with your caravan. This is the most highly attended gathering of Jews on the planet. Now, let me point out one other thing that's utterly essential. See, at Passover, you gave grain offering. Barley had been harvested. First part of barley you bring to the temple, you give to God. Pass or Pentecost, wheat offering, wheat harvest, you give it to God. Except for the fact you take it to the temple, you don't pour it into big vats. You give it to, you, 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 you put leaven in it, you put uh, yeast in it, and you, and, you, and you knead the dough, and you give it to the folks that are attending the, the, uh, the, uh, the ovens, the outdoor ovens, and they bake it off into two loaves. And it says in Leviticus that you take these two loaves and you wave them to God. Why? We learn from Paul, we learn from Deuteronomy, we learn from the Old and New Testament that the leaven in this bread represents your disgust, your sin your dirt, your evil desires in every man's heart, as it says in Genesis. That's what, the, that's what the leaven, that's what the yeast represents. 
And so at Pentecost, more than Passover, you don't, even, you don't take the beginning product, which is the grain. You take the complete product, which is the loaves of bread, and you wave it to God. Why? To get in anger? No, no. To remind yourself the thing that stands between you and Yahweh is your despicable, sinful nature. So, you're traveling 10, 20, 100, 500 miles carrying the sack of grain with your family. You grind it, you knead it, continually, constantly reminded of the sinfulness of your heart. You're reciting prayers, you're rereading Genesis, you're reminding yourself why you're sinful. You're bringing your kids along. You're letting them get their hands dirty. You're reciting stories from Scripture that remind them that you might think you're innocent, but you're not. Telling the stories of grandfather and great-grandfather, and of course, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, right? And it's building. It's building the anticipation of this opportunity to wave the bread and then to break it and celebrate that God's providence is what got you into the land of Canaan, not your ability. But woe is me, because in this bread is sin. In this body is sin. Even in the innocent children, there is selfishness. Let's play that track. You see... In, ver- in chapter 1, verse 13, and chapter 1, verse 15, we sort of get a sense of what's happening in the time approaching Pentecost, right? We think, biblical scholars think, it, would take, it takes place in about a week because it talks about one, uh, one Sabbath, and then, of course, Pentecost celebration starts on another Sabbath. So the men, right, they gathered, and we learned from a sermon that the women were there praying constantly with them, right? So as a matter of fact, there were 120 believers, it tells us in verse 15 of chapter 1. And they gathered because they had to take care of some business. Judas. Judas had betrayed the Messiah. So, of course, they cast lots, if you remember this, right? They cast lots. Matthias. They replaced the 12. All 12 tribes of Israel need need to be represented here, right? So they get their band of 12. They're surrounded by 120, right? And it's relatively quiet. It's relatively quiet because all they hear is the drum beats and the stomping of of sojourners, of people coming from far and wide, from the whole ends of the earth, it says in the scriptures and Acts, right? Coming to Jerusalem. So all they can hear is drum beats, right? Because no one's arrived yet. It's still a week out, but families are coming because it's hard to tell, you know, the journey sometimes you got to give or take a few days. But the drum beats get closer. The stomping gets closer, Right? The anticipation is rising. They're assembling their band of missionaries in disguise. Why? Because they're Christians. They're followers of the way of this new Messiah that was resurrected. And they're going to be surrounded by Jews that will scoff and beat and ultimately have blood on their hands. Turn it up a little bit. Of course, these caravans are coming not by the tens, not by the hundreds. There will be millions, right? And the Jews have memorized certain parts of Psalms. Turn it up, right? And they've memorized the book of Ruth, and they've memorized big portions of Scripture that they will chant at the temple, right? Because there's a whole celebratory component, right? And it's a party. But more than that, it is worship. We are to remind ourselves, not of Passover, not of, not of simply exodusing, not of getting out from slavery, Right? but the whole process of getting to the promised land where there's milk and honey. So they're reverent. They're they're going inside. If you've ever been in a worship service where everyone else is singing and all you can do is put your hands in front of your face and get on your knees, this was the reverence that came when we waved bread and reminded ourselves of sin, our despicable sin. Turn it up, Glenn. Right? And as the fair caravans came, there are certain numbers that said there were millions. Millions in a town that could only handle a couple thousand. Right? They had to put in extra, you know, ancient history equivalent support potties 
you can imagine what that looks like. They had to bake three, four times as many clay ovens just to handle all of the bread that needed to be baked off. Why? To break and just eat, a, have a feast and to say, mm, that's delicious, barley, that's delicious. No, no, no. To remind themselves of their disgust. But let's not be wrong here. This was a celebration. This was a celebration because nothing is as bad as slavery. Nothing is as bad as shackles fettered around your ankles and whips ka, cracking you on the back. Turn it up, Glenn, right? And so when it came day for the Pentecost, right? Turn it up. When it became day for the Pentecost, it was loud in Jerusalem, okay? It was really loud, right? It was so loud that the scriptures say Peter had to stand up and shout. Do you realize that this is the very first sermon ever recorded by a Christian, by a preacher, and he had to stand up and be a Southern Baptist, African American, black preacher, and scream at the top of his lungs. The scripture said that they were in the house of the Lord. If you read in the New Testament and you read in the Old Testament that the temple is also called the house, somewhere between whoosh, this wind coming that was the Holy Spirit, somewhere between there and the first sermon, the 120 left the house and went to the temple. This is where everyone was congregating. This is where everyone was congregating. There were thousands and thousands and thousands of Christians, uh uh-uh, anti-Christians. There were thousands of people that Peter will tell us killed the Messiah. So Peter stands up and he says, pay attention, Israel. I've got something to say. As a matter of fact, it says the 11 stood up. Why? Because he needed bodyguards. That's why. We like to think of the first sermon. We like to read scripture in the quietness of our own bedrooms. When there was a lot of loud and a lot of noise in Jerusalem, it was obnoxious that first Christian worship service during that first Christian sermon. He was loud, he was screaming so loud over these over these over this celebration, so loud over the chants, so loud over the drums, that you had to really squint your ears, turn your ear, because what he was saying was priceless. Turn it down, bro. What he was saying all the way down. What he was saying was priceless. Perhaps when it says that everyone heard the news in their own language, this is what it sounded like. Because folks, when the Spirit catches your heart, all the sounds in your life disappear. So it was loud. Oh, it was really loud. But some of them heard this. In the last days, God says, I will pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and your daughters, your young men, your old men, even on my servants. Do you know how crazy it is to say that even your slaves have this God? Men and women, I will pour out my spirit in those days. Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. How radical this is to a people that just journeyed and spent their life savings to get to Jerusalem, and he's telling them it's all for naught from this time forward. No sacrifices, no burnt offerings. Notice I said no sacrifices and no burnt offerings. Oh, there's sacrifice and offerings. But it's the kind that resides in the depths of your heart. Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit, the promises for you and your children and for all who are far off. You've got to see this. 
We're talking about the first sermon. We're talking about the first time someone stands and proclaims the good news in the name of the resurrected Lord Jesus Christ by the power of the Holy Spirit that just blew through Jerusalem, that caught everyone's attention, gathered a crowd, people thinking they're drunk. This got attention. It's not like Pastor Ryan preaching in a small sanctuary up on the hill. There are thousands and thousands hearing this good news for the first time. Your sons and your daughters and your young men and your old men and your servants and your men and women, I will pour out my spirit too. And he says again, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit, you and your children and for all who are far off. He makes the boldest statement ever proclaimed and says, it doesn't matter if you're Jew. This good news is for everyone. Now, he's saying this to 100,000 Jews. You're not in the holy club anymore. Oh, how this is still a challenge to the 21st century Christians. But that's not all he said, right? That's not all he said. He said, the spirit of God is for all people, not just Jews, but on that very first sermon, at the height of human history, at the pinnacle of God's providential plan for humanity and for the universe, at the, pin- at the heels of the resurrection of the Christ, at the coming, the, of the, of, uh, the coming of the Pentecost, which is essentially the coming of the Holy Spirit, we find out that forgiveness for sins is not just while it's burning while it's being broken, while it's being waved, while it's being slaughtered. This forgiveness is for all time. The good news is that this Holy Spirit that empowers you to witness to the resurrection can be harbored and held in the quietness of your own heart, but not just yours, everyone's, for all time. That's a good spot for an amen. Amen. Let me show you something else, church. Oops. Let me see if I can get you dizzy with that board up there. Take a look at these verses. See, when you grab a text, when you grab some scripture and you hide it in your heart, as a matter of fact, the scripture a couple times says that's a res- way of resisting sin. Well, let me tell you from personal experience, if you grab a scripture and you hide it in your heart, if you grab a scripture, like I said earlier, with the metaphor of swimming, and you go snorkeling in it for a whole week, you, the, the spirit starts using it to speak to you afresh and anew, right? Let me tell you what hit me like a brick at about 11 p.m. last night. Now, I know it's quiet. But let's be there, right? The sense of baking bread, right? You know, when you bake in an outdoor clay oven, the bottom always gets slightly charred. So slightly charred baked bread, emanating the entire town, drums, firecrackers, chants, stomping, kids running around getting yelled at by parents, right? Be there. And the Peter that stands up Surrounded by 11, 12, plus the 120. It says, this good news is for all people and for all time. But he says in 2.17 and then again in 2.40, essentially the same thing. Hang on to this, church. This got me last night. If you repent, Peter says, I will pour out my spirit on all people. Hold on to that. At the end of his sermon. With many other words, he warned them and he pleaded with them, save yourselves from this corrupt generation, from this evil. Okay? Okay. When's the last time you pictured what God's grace looks like? I imagine if we were forced to draw it on a piece of paper. I imagine if I told you to close your eyes and imagine a symbol of God's grace. After prompting you with verse 2, 17, 
you might think of a shower head, maybe a little uh, Roundup sprayer, psh, 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 <laughs> spray bottle, you know, something to give you a little mist and make you feel cool in the morning. This verb is like Niagara Falls. If you repent, Peter says, he is talking to the Jews who have perfected repentance of a certain kind. The repentance that looks like pilgrimages. The repentance that looks like measuring every squared off edge of every tabernacle and every synagogue. The repentance that looks like orienting all your things to be a certain shape and a certain size and a certain color. The repentance of the Feast of Tabernacles and the repentance of this and the repentance of that and the repentance of Passover and Pentecost. And Peter gets up, screams at the top of his lungs, you've had it wrong all along. This repentance is repentance of the guilt of your heart. And if you do that, you open up the floodgates of grace. What is it on the other side of Kaka Falls? Try standing under that. Let that be your image of God pouring the Holy Spirit on you. Let that be the sensation when God says, no longer are you held guilty if you repent in your heart and you receive my son. You think I have a small tea kettle and I've got a raging waterfall of blessings in the power and presence of this Holy Spirit. But right at the end, his voice starting to crack, people starting to turn, let go of their drums, and looking at this crazy Peter guy screaming the first sermon. He says, save yourself. Now, I'm going to be a dork for a second, okay? This is a bad translation. The Greek is a passive imperative, which means you don't save yourselves, right? Because that would not be a passive. That would be an active imperative, right? That would be telling you what to do. Okay, let me step back from the dorkhood, okay? The better translation is let yourself be saved. You know, here in America, just like in my house growing up, right? The symbol of success was this right? I'm tying my boots, right? We weren't allowed to wear slippers because you couldn't do work in the yard in slippers growing up. Tie your boots. You weren't allowed. We had the, we had the belt test at my What was that? That was you walked over before school and my mom got one good yank on your pants and if they fell off, you had to give them to your big brother and you had to get the other ones you had, right? Why? Because you can't get work done if you're sagging your pants. We were a, pull, a tighten your boots pull, or pull up your boots Tighten your belt kind of family. We were all American boys, as my grandfather said. You bite your lower lip and you fight. We grew up thinking anything was accomplishable. You can do anything, my parents would tell us. Get your education and there is no end to what you can do. You can imagine some minor disappointment that I went into ministry. You can do anything. Tighten that belt up. Don't leave this double button stuff open. Put the top one on and get business taken care of, okay? All American boys. If there was a way towards salvation, if you sweated hard enough in my family, you could get it. Save yourself. Now, that's my kind of Fasani language. Save yourself. You mean tighten up those, those, those black leather boots, right? Pull up your pants, tuck in your shirt, and put your work gloves on. Save yourself. Right, Peter? Right, Peter? You can do anything you want, right, Peter? Save yourself, clench your fist, get the white knuckles, grin your teeth, and make it happen. This is a bad, bad translation. Because this salvation church doesn't look like gripping something, manhandling it, owning it, and accomplishing it. It looks more like receiving it. Let yourself be saved, is how Peter ends this sermon. We're talking to thousands of people that just weathered hundreds of miles of traversing awful deserts to bring their families along to pay homage, to worship, to meet the Lord in the required ritual of Pentecost, and you're telling them now to let it go? for the kind of Niagara Falls sort of blessings. P. 
Peter screams over all the crowds, the good news is that you just need to let go. That's it. I don't know what's in happening in your life. Some of you have been sharing with me some of your struggles. I, I don't understand. I don't understand. But what I do understand is that there's a point at which you cannot do it anymore. There's a point at which Peter screams right into your heart, it is not capable for you to accomplish this. Folks, the good news of the first sermon, of the first church, of the second chapter, of the story of how God put a stamp of approval on those early Christians gathering was that this Holy Spirit, this forgiveness, this baptism, baptismal initiation into a new life all begins with letting it go and saying, I'm sorry, God. You want to define, you want to define repentance? Because you can do a word search, you can do a Google search, you can do everything. Let me tell you in one sentence, let go. And say, I'm sorry. And there's a Niagara Falls waiting to pour down on your household, into your heart, onto your life. And that's the first sermon ever preached. Amen. <laughs> We've stepped away from it for a couple of weeks, but I want to bring it back because I think it's so helpful and you've all affirmed that. We try to commit to making a two or shorter minute summary, summation of the service, or excuse me, of the, of the sermon, a takeaway. Uh, if you get nothing else, take this with you into the world. So here it is. On the greatest, on the biggest, on the most well-traveled and highly attended festival in Jerusalem, God shows up and preaches through the voice piece of Peter this sermon. Over all the noise, over all the chaos, over all the sound, repent. Repent once and for all, and I will pour out a Niagara fall of blessings through my Holy Spirit on your life. For all people, for all time, repent receive the good news. Kona Church of the Nazarene, in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, go in the power, especially in the power of the Holy Spirit, and be the good news in Kona this week. God bless you. Amen. Amen.